All right, let's move on to the Midwest region here, guys, where Purdue has been dominant. If there were questions about uh, whether or not they would be shook with the pressure uh, from the NCAA tournament, trying to get that monkey off Matt Painter's back, I think they were answered in that opening week. But they have a, a significant test coming up in Gonzaga, a team that that knocked off Bill Self's, Self's Kansas team, albeit a shorthanded version, pretty easily. So, um, Isaac, going to start with you on this one. Who do you like in this matchup, Purdue versus Gonzaga? Well, it's just a completely different team than what Purdue saw at the beginning of the year. Because Gonzaga, first 15 games of the year, they shot 31% from three. Since that point, since like the last you know 16 games, they're shooting over 41% from three-point range. Like This is a different club. But I think Purdue here is kind of what Gonzaga wants to do on steroids. I like Purdue's matchups kind of across the board. Braden Smith and Ryan Nemhard, those are both two of the best point guards in college basketball. Graham Ike and Zach Eady, those are both two of the best big men in college basketball. But I think I'd give Purdue the nod there, right? Like going out on a limb, taking the National Player of the Year uh, over EK in that spot. And then I like Purdue's complementary pieces a little bit more than what Gonzaga's have been. They're good. But I think what Purdue's have right now, they're in a, just a different mental space. Lance Jones is playing some of his best basketball of his career. Fletcher Lawyer really shook off that little midseason lull that he had. He's been playing much better. The addition of Cam Heidi has been a big game changer, I think, for Purdue. Six foot seven, knows how to cut, can knock down corner threes, just really active on the glass. You throw Trey Kaufman Ren in there as well, too. So I think that Purdue's depth in the backcourt really is the game changer here because I think I trust two of Gonzaga's guards and I think I have three and maybe even four Purdue guards that I'm starting to learn how to trust a little bit so give me Purdue Chris who you got listen uh, I've made this comment on TV yesterday how many guards can say they beat UK both UK's Kansas and Kentucky and only made two, two shots that's mm -hmm. that's Ryan Nimhart you know one for seven and one for six and made zero threes in both games and controlled the game in both ways with the pick and roll. The question is, how's Purdue going to guard the pick and roll? They got to keep Ryan Nemehard out of the game. You could talk about EK, you could talk about Hickman, you could talk about Huff and those guys and the way they've been shooting basketball. One of those guys who doesn't shoot the basketball that well is Ryan Nemehard. And so my thing is, it's going to come down to, you know, Zach Eady is going to be Zach Eady, right? There's never going to be a situation where you're going to take him out of the game. He doesn't get in foul trouble. He sits back and drop coverage, Frank, you know that, and you're going to have to find a way to score. And sometimes he'll get out and guard some ball screens. The question is, and I always say this in NCAA tournament games, Gonzaga, life without Drew Timmy. I never would have forecast that they would be doing what they're doing. Got some really good seating, like you say, a Kansas team that was down this year. But we got to give credit where credit is due. You know, the Hall of Fame coach that they have, Right. And Mark Few has found a way. And we've always thought of Gonzaga, who's had eight first round picks in the last 10 years of being that team. They don't have a pro on this team, in my opinion, but they have a team. They're collective. They're deep. Anton Watts, if they can get Zach Eady away from the basket. And sometimes this may be counter what people think. You got to take EK out of the game. Right. And mm -hmm. now you got to make Zach Eady come out and play where he can't sit under the basket. It's a very different team. Sure, Lance Jones has come along and he helps him a little bit on the perimeter. But again, if you can't stop them from getting downhill, Kickman and Nimhart get into the lane. You got to pull Zach Eady out. There has to be someone on the perimeter that pulls Eady out because if he just sits there as a goalie on offense, and sits there as a guy in the middle of the lane on, I'm sorry, on defense, he sits as a goalie, and you can't stop him on offense, you can't win, right? You have to take advantage of the fact that he has to be pulled out, and you have to live with what he does on offense. You mentioned before Braden Smith, tremendous guard. I think Lance Jones is an X factor for them. But here's the thing, guys, and the last point I make, it's going to come down to the last five minutes of the game if Gonzaga's up. And and I want Matt Painter to be successful. I mean, I've certainly put my jabs into what Purdue perdoned and and different things. But the coach in me, for as much success as he's had in conference, I want him to win. Right? He's not going to lose to a double digit seed this year. But if he loses to a, 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 a Gonzaga team that's an underdog, right? People will still give him a hard time because it, right now they think he should punch his ticket to the Elite Eight. You know, what's interesting is that I was really wondering if this Purdue team was going to come out and be tight. I mean, let's face it. We saw that a lot. We can we can X and O and talk about defensive ball coverage and all that as much as we want. But sometimes in this setting, the team that's tight loses and there's no more scheme or strategy to it than that. It's just about handling the moment sometimes. This Purdue team did not seem tight. They won their first two games by an average of 33 points per game. 
and I'll echo what I've been saying for the last month or so, is that stylistically, uh, this is a different team than they were last year, even though they still have the most dominant player in the country in the middle. They are now uh, playing much faster. They went from one of the worst three-point shooting teams to, as of this morning when we are recording, the best three-point shooting team in all of college basketball. They went from a freshman backcourt uh, to now two guys who are sophomores. And we were talking about the health and whether or not that was going to be a factor. Braden came out and he looked healthy. He had a double-double, 11 and 10, and they were able to limit his minutes to just 22 in that second round game. So he looks much healthier now than he did in that Big Ten Big Ten tournament. I think that is a huge subplot uh, for Purdue. And we talk about this, this backcourt that were freshmen a year ago. We were holding them to such a high standard. Now they're sophomores. They've got a little bit more experience. I like Purdue, but I'm really intrigued by your point, Chris. If Purdue gets an early lead, does, does Mark Few yank EK and say, you know what, we're going small and we're pulling Purdue uh, we're pulling Edie away from the basket. I will tell you this, if it happens this, whether or not it happens this game remains to be seen, but it will certainly happen at some point if Purdue continues to march on. So that's an interesting uh, subplot to watch here uh, as we continue to break break down this, this, uh, this game. All right, let's stay in this Midwest region, Creighton versus Tennessee. Um, now I'm fascinated to see how you guys are going to break this down because I remember, was, I don't want to say it was chippy, but there was a, um, contrasting opinion last week. So Chris, I'm going to start with you. Um, Rick Barnes, Tennessee tough. I know they're your team. You still like them this week? Absolutely. I got to have one final four team after Baylor lost last night. I mean, I'm, I'm down to one team now, so I got to stick with my guns and I love Tennessee. I think they have a, a lot of pieces, obviously dog connect is one of my favorite players. I've been, I've been browbeaten, browbeaten, shall I say, by Wally Zerbiak, who found a, found a clone of himself in the NCAA tournament. So, again, I've had to deal with that for the last week. But, but you know, it comes down to this in the NCAA tournament, guys, and they're going to play against Creighton. Creighton had to outlast Oregon. Oregon is similar to NC State, a team who was double-digit, won their league, but more talented, had injuries, uh, than more talented than people thought. Uh, Jackson Shellstead going down, hurt uh, in the overtime. And, and now here they are with, with Creighton, who's three-point shoot uh, heavy. Uh, I, I think they lost, uh, just backing up to the Oregon game, I thought they, they lost uh, uh, some three-point shooters in critical moments. And that's what happens when you don't play against teams in a conference. You don't know them that well. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you, you put yourself in a situation where in overtime and now you lose the game, which is Oregon. I thought they were going to win that game. But it's, Greg McDermott's one of one of the best coaches uh, in the country. A eh? But they have a short bench, guys. They have a small bench. What they don't do, uh, what they do well, shall I say, is they don't foul you. Oregon never. only got five free throws that game. They that never. is amazing to me. And someone's got to crack that code. How do you, Because if they don't foul, guess what? In longer timeouts in the NCAA tournament, none of those guys are sitting. They're playing with their best. And that's the way Duke used to beat you. They would get six guys and those six guys would play the whole game. You would never get a break because you always, okay, we got a chance when they sub. Well, they don't sub that much at Creighton. And Colt Brenner is sitting there as a goalie talking about ultimate drop coverage. I mean, he's going to sit there and you're going to have to score at the rim. And, and they're not the most athletic team. Alexander certainly is. But Tennessee is certainly athletic. Jonas, I do. We got to see what he can do against Colt Brenner. I don't think you can challenge him. I think it has to be an up and down game. Connect is a X factor. He's similar, but uh, to Baylor Shireman. Baylor Shireman obviously can do more things than Connect. I think he's an undervalued player in a lot of ways because of his ability to rebound and his playmaking skills. But Dalton Connect has not really connected the way he needs to and where he's going to have to in these games. And here's last point I make about the transfer portal. Look what Gonzaga did. They got EK, they got Nimhart, right? And they're playing to go to Elite Eight. Who in their right mind would have thought? You mentioned Freddie Dillingham and all the NIO money he's got. Who would have meant, who would have thought that Dalton Connect would come from Northern Colorado and be a first team All American? That is, like, there is no one in, the, in their world. I know you guys think you guys are authority. Don't tell me you picked him in a portal to do what he's doing at Tennessee. After, but I know this. This is what could happen, though. And I'm not saying this is the case. Are these moments too big for a kid who came from Northern Colorado and never had these type of expectations? The kids on Creighton have. Stephen Ashworth hasn't, but he made a big time shot. I mentioned before in the Oregon game. But these guys on Creighton, they were a game away. It, uh, Dalton Connect has never experienced this. 
Well, he didn't play well. He didn't play well against Texas. That's that's no. for sure. It'd be interesting. And then he didn't play well in the SEC tournament. And so the question is, is that going to be a big storyline? To me, we will see. Creighton has been there before. Obviously, I'm a Big East guy, but because I picked Tennessee and it's my last team, I'm staying with Rocky Top. All right, Isaac, are you staying? Uh, are you staying with Creighton? I think you had him as a Final Four pick. I did. I think I'm pivoting though and joining Chris on this one because. I I think that there's oh, something. Guys waffling. I mean, this is crazy. You know, like, eh. <laughs> hey, I stuck to my guns on Duke, so I can, I'm okay to pivot on this one. I don't know if I love this matchup quite as much for Creighton as I did before. If it's a jump shooting contest, Creighton's winning, right? If we're just jump shooting contest, right? Creighton's the better shooting team. Tennessee has had some struggles making shots. I think the physicality that Tennessee progresses and that they can bring off the bench is really different. To me, Jemai Meshack is really the guy here that's the X factor for me. We could talk about Dalton Connect making shots and Zakai Ziegler against drop coverage. That's all great. But Meshack, when he comes off the bench, if he's not getting screened and he is refusing any straight line drives for Trey Alexander or Baylor Shireman or whenever he gets matched up on Stephen Ashworth, that feels like Creighton's going to have to take and make a bunch of tough shots to beat Tennessee. So I think Tennessee's process is going to be a little bit easier and their game plan is going to be a little bit easier to execute than against Creighton. Cause I feel like Creighton's going to have to make, I mean, they made some tough ones late against Oregon to force overtime. I think they're going to have to make a ton of those to beat Tennessee. Cause a lot of these perimeter defenders for Tennessee just aren't going to give up those straight line drives. All right, guys. So I'll, I'll say this, uh, Chris, since you've converted Isaac onto the, the Tennessee train there, somebody has got to make a case for Creighton. My, my case is this, is that I think that um, you can expect Tennessee is going to shut down that big three of, of Creighton's. They're going to shut down Baylor Shireman, Kalk Brenner and Trey Alexander, or at least that's what they're going to focus the majority of their attention on. Now, if you really dig into this Creighton team, you'll see that they shoot a lot of threes, as they do every year, but they have been a, more, a streakier shooting team this year than they have in the past. That is the X factor. So what it comes down to, in my mind, is when they are dared to make shots, the Miller and Ashworth make threes. If those two guys make six or more threes combined, I think Creighton wins this game. Without it, I think Tennessee's defense is going to be too much for them to overcome. It's going to be very interesting, but... Uh, the, the points are all well taken. Creighton never fouls. The, you know the other thing they don't do? They don't give up threes. So it's going to be very interesting to see if Dalton Connect can bounce back. There's a variety of interesting subplots here. 